Welcome to The Two Testaments, a guided journey through scripture with leading experts on the Bible. Hosted by Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or at thetwotestaments.com. Follow us on Twitter at the number two testaments or ask questions in our Facebook group. Welcome to the Two Testaments podcast, a guided journey through scripture. I'm Ronnie Cosman. And I'm Will Kynes. In this episode, we're looking at Job's complaints in chapters six, seven, and in a couple of other chapters as well. Uh, we're joined today with Dr. Tremper Longman. Now, Tremper Longman is Emeritus Professor of Biblical Studies at Westmont College, where he served from 1998 to 2017. Uh, and he's written or co-authored numerous scholarly articles and more than 20 books, uh, including interdisciplinary works and books with a psychologist friend of his, Dan Allender, works on history and historiography and textbooks for both seminary students and lay people. I have a couple of his books with me uh, here, uh, the fear of the Lord is wisdom, which walks through all of the quote unquote wisdom books. There's a little bit of, of debate between me and Trevor <laughs> within the, the uh, covers of this book. Uh, and then a commentary on Job. Um, put out by Baker, uh, by Trimper, which is a really helpful resource if you want to dig even deeper into some of the things that we're going to be talking about in our conversation today. So I'm, I've, for a long time, really appreciated uh, Trimper's scholarship. There's a great breadth to it. Um, did his PhD on Ecclesiastes and its ancient Near Eastern context. Uh, that was at Yale, correct? Yep, yep. yep. Uh, yeah. But then also writing books that anybody could pick up. Uh, and understand, uh, which is really helpful. In addition to his scholarship, he's had an indelible, he left an indelible mark on me personally. In fact, <laughs> uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, on my thumb here, there is a scar that I have that I've had since I was, I think, four years old in Cambridge uh, when Trimper's son and I were playing and we um, there was this huge oak chest and both of us were closing the oak chest <laughs> and one of us may have let go of the chest before the other, and somehow the the top of the chest fell on my thumb, oh, uh, crushed my thumb. Uh, in fact, it was there. It was dicey whether they would have to amputate my thumb or not. Which was, but we were in the UK, and the, the National Healthcare Service there took good care of me. <laughs> but from then on, you know, my parents have told me, Trimper Longman's son and you were playing, and that's when that happened. So I'd always heard of this Trimper Longman guy, uh, and then as I got into biblical scholarship, started to read his work, and thought, oh, that's the guy. That's the guy. <laughs> right. So uh, it's a pleasure uh, to, to meet with you and uh, talk with you today about uh, Job, and particularly the complaints in the book of Job. Now, Trimper, before we uh, jump into, you know, the nitty-gritty of the text, we like to hit a few orienting questions. Uh, what first drew you to the book of Job? So what drew me to the book of Job? As I reflected on that, I wish I had a kind of heart-rending story. Uh, <laughs> what brought me to the book of Job? And, and indeed, you know, I've always been fascinated with Job ever since I became a Christian. And particularly when I started studying the Old Testament seriously. Uh, and, and of course, uh, we always think and um, that Job is primarily about a book about suffering. We learn a lot about suffering. So, of course, at periods of time where I've struggled with various personal issues, I've turned to the Lament Psalms and to Job, etc., but what drew me to the book of Job in a scholarly way to write about it is what often draws me to uh, various book projects, commentaries, and others. Uh, publisher at Baker, Jim Kinney, said, I want you to write a commentary on Job. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're talking about Job's complaints in particular within the book of Job. How do you see Job's complaints fitting into the message of the book of Job as a whole? Okay, sure. Yeah. So that raises the question what I, you know, what I think the book of Job is is doing overall. And so I think, um, and this is my friend John Walton. John Walton and I also co-authored a how to read Job book. And uh in there, he talks about Job as a thought experiment. And I think that's true, that um this is not. A uh, historical book. It doesn't fit into the history of redemption. I, I think it's really important 
to myself to defend the uh, historical truthfulness of books like Exodus and Conquest that fit into the um, fit into the history of redemption. But but Job's a wisdom book, and it's reflecting on a question. And the question I think is the all the the, the primary question is who is wise. Where do we get wisdom? And Job's suffering becomes a kind of uh, springboard for that discussion because um, um, because after Job suffers, there's this lengthy section in the book of interaction between uh, Job and his three friends and eventually Elihu, all of whom are claiming to have wisdom, you know, in the sense of I'm able, uh, we're able to diagnose Job's situation and uh, prescribe a remedy for him uh, mm-hmm. to get out. So um, Job's complaints, of course, fit into the interaction with the three friends, and um, and 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 it has a very set kind of rhythm to it where, you know, um, Eliphaz will speak, Job will respond, Bildad will speak, Job will respond so far, Job responds, go through that cycle a a second time. And then the third time the cycle breaks down so that while Eliphaz gives a lengthy speech, uh, Bildad gives a very brief, I think, five verse speech in chapter 25. And we don't hear from Zophar, who's the most hot-headed of them all in my reading uh and he kind of burns himself out uh-huh. but uh but so it's it's as part of that interaction between uh so job himself is claiming a sort of wisdom uh, an ability to uh just diagnose what what is going wrong and and actually uh he has a strategy for getting out of it that differs with his three friends okay uh, Tremper, what for you is the most difficult aspect to understand about the about Job's complaints? <laughs> well, first of all, translating. <laughs> <laughs> Job is tough Hebrew in yeah. in many ways, and so um, so that that's one of it. Uh, one thing, and 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 um, yeah. So I I'd say maybe that actually is the hardest. Uh, part of it, but that's true of the entire book of Job in the poetical sections, at right. least. Yeah, for our listeners, could you flesh out a little bit about what makes the Hebrew of Job a little bit more complicated than you know the Hebrew of Genesis or Exodus? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it uses a lot, uh, a higher proportion of rare words, words that occur once, twice, three times. Secondly, it's poetry, and poetry is kind of asyntactical <laughs> anyway. Uh, not non-syntactical, but I think asyntactical. So sometimes you're wondering, is it a direct object or a subject? Uh, you're wondering about how to translate the, the verb. Since Hebrew doesn't have tense, you know, uh, how to render a Hebrew word into uh, you know, present or future or past, even when we get to Job's complaints, uh, one of the thing you, one of the things you've done in your scholarship a good bit in the past is looked at these biblical texts within their ancient Near Eastern context. So, how do Job's complaints compare to similar complaints that we see in other ancient Near Eastern texts? Yeah, that's that's a great question, um, and and I'll answer it in reference to two different types of ancient Near Eastern writing. Uh, first of all, I, I once wrote a chapter of a book placing Hebrew laments in the context of mainly Babylonian laments. And it's been a while, but I remember that my main conclusion was the Babylonian laments were a lot more whiny <laughs> and, <laughs> and cringing than Job's lament. I mean, Job, you know, will sometimes say, you know, well, Job is actually very, very bold. Um, and in 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 his talk about God. Mm-hmm. Um, and so 
in something I didn't see in the Babylonian laments. And then, of course, you also have texts that are similar to Job, like the Babylonian theodicy and the um, and the um, oh, little, little bell nemeki. Yeah. Um, and it's um, it's the theodicy that's most similar to Job, where you have a sufferer uh, who is interacting with a friend. Um, and and um, yeah, so I just think Job, I, I, I actually think that uh, both Babylonian theodicy and Job represent a kind of genre of literature uh, that are related uh, but but I, I personally find Job much more sophisticated, mature, interacting with these ideas in creative ways. Yeah. Yeah. The interesting point you make about the boldness of Job. Do you have any ideas about where that comes from, that Job has this boldness in his relationship with God that we don't see in other complaint traditions? Yeah, that, that's a good question, Will. Um, I, well, I I would say, and now I'm kind of relying on the lament psalms as well. Um, and who knows exactly? Well, I, I think Job is at least in its final form is one of the later books of mm-hmm. the Old Testament. But but I I would say because the Israelites understood God to actually invite a kind of bold <laughs> approach to suffering. And, and and not cringe, um, right. and so so um, so I think that's really kind of significant, and See, and is also I think ultimately instructive to us when we suffer as well, right? Because yeah. Christians have a really hard time complaining, yeah, <laughs> to God. They just kind of repress it, which is not very healthy. Shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think, I mean, we often, if you hear from Job in churches, it's often only, you know, Job 121, where Job expresses his mm. acceptance of what the suffering that he's faced and his faith yeah. in light of that. Uh, you hear less of the complaints that we're going to be talking about. And as we're going to, as we're going to see, there's some reasons why you can understand people <laughs> might be tempted to skip over these parts of the book of Job. So let's look at, at what Job is doing in these complaints. And um, as Ronnie mentioned, we're going to kind of focus on chapter six and seven, but we'll jump around a little bit just to get some other examples. And if we look at six and seven, I think what we see here is four major things that Job does in his complaints throughout. So there is first disputing with his friends, and then second, holding to his integrity, and then third, describing his suffering, and then fourth, accusing God. And this is where we get at that boldness that you've mentioned. Um, Anything you'd add to that list? Well, uh, as I thought about it, um, not from six and seven, from elsewhere, I think uh, we see him also uh, kind of considering his strategy, how to respond mm-hmm. to his suffering, you know, and, and I, I would describe it this way, uh, whereas the three friends uh, are arguing, you're, you're suffering, Job, because you're a sinner, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because they're working with this kind of theology that if you sin, then you suffer. Therefore, if you suffer, then you sin. So the they're pushing their remedy. They're setting themselves up as wisdom teachers. Their remedy is repent, you know. Uh, and Job is saying, no, no, no. This is the holding on to integrity part. He 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 knows that the suffering that he is experiencing is not a result of sin. That doesn't necessarily mean he does that. He thinks he's perfect, but he's just saying, uh, you know, my sin does not deserve this <laughs> amount of, <laughs> of suffering. So his, his, um, or I think his diagnosis is, well, God's unjust, right? You know, God's unjust, which by the way, shows that he, fundamentally accepts that retribution theology right. yeah, right. because that's the only basis on which you could say God's unjust because I should only, su- I should only suffer if I'm a sinner. Right. But his remedy then is 
um, I need to go set God straight, you know, right. yeah. <laughs> God, God is unjust and I need to confront God. Yeah. Doesn't so. uh, Job 23, 10 fit really nicely with what you just mentioned, Tremper? It, it's one that we kind of translate in, you know, but he knows the way that I take when he has tested me, I shall come out like gold. Mm -hmm. no, that's yeah. a verse that we often translate as a kind of like, I'm going to be refined through my suffering. Mm -hmm. Whereas Job seems to be saying, no, he knows that I am pious. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a way you take yeah. that? That fits into well, your. I'd have to go back and look at my commentary. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but uh, yeah. My foot uh, has held fast to his steps. I have kept yeah. his way and have right. not turned aside. You right. Know? Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely think that that fits in with this theme. And, and there's an interesting kind of uh, development in Job's thought in one area. And that has to do with his idea that there might be someone in heaven who will help me. OK, mm -hmm. so so let me let me take you through this uh, development here. Bear with me as I turn first to chapter nine. Um, while you while you set that up, Trimper, I just want to yeah. point out I did open your commentary. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what you say. Job is confident, at least in this speech at this time, that if God tests him, he will come mm -hmm. out fine. So there you go. Exactly. All right. Thank right. you. Yeah. Good, 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 good. <laughs> nice work, Trevor. <laughs> yeah. Good insight, Ronnie. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, so you were going to take us, maybe we can yeah. jump back to that progression that you're about to take us on and, and work up to it by looking at a few of these, um, okay. these different aspects of his complaints. Oh yeah, sure. Oh yeah. Because I think that'll fit in well when we get to uh, the fourth part. But so okay. the first part is disputing with the friends. And an example from chapter six and seven would be uh, chapter six, verses 24 and 25. You see these kind of interactions with the friends a good bit. In later speeches, it often comes right at the beginning of Job's speech. But here he says, teach me to the friends and I will be silent. Make me understand how I have gone wrong. Uh, how forceful are honest words, but your reproof, what does it reprove? Right? So we get this arguing back and forth over their words and their effectiveness. Do we see any kind of progress in the debate as it proceeds in terms of the friends and Job? Do they convince each other of anything? Yeah, my my reading is no, they don't. <laughs> that, that they're talking by each other mostly. Um, they don't interact with specific arguments that one makes typically and there's no progression there's no convincing um uh, of the of the three friends or of job by the end um does job win the debate no i don't think so in the sense of convincing them i just think they run out of steam at the end <laughs> Right. And that's the way some people read that third cycle where the friends stop talking is they've just run out of stuff to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, they, they, they've been saying the same thing over and over and over again. There's no progress in their, their argument. Right. So, I mean, a lot of people then wonder why do you have why? Because especially if it's a thought experiment and it's not reflecting an actual historical event, then you realize that the composer actually created these three characters. Why three? Not Why not one like the Babylonian theodicy? And I think the answer is that it shows a kind of societal uh, norm being piled on Job, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and also showing the kind of uh, ineffectiveness of their arguments. Yeah. So the second thing that Will just, you know, suggested Job does in his complaints is that Job holds fast to his integrity. So an example of this is in chapter 27, verse five, uh, where Job says, far be it from me to say that you are right until I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. Right. And you also get an example in chapter six. So chapter six, verses 29 and 30, uh, turn, I pray, let no wrong be done. Turn now, my vindication is at stake. Is there any wrong on my tongue? Um, so, you know, this idea that he, is, he wants to yeah. be vindicated, yeah. his integrity is at stake. So why, why is Job holding so tightly to his integrity? And is he right to do, to, to, <laughs> to do so? 
Yeah, uh, I think, A, he holds to his integrity because he knows it's not because he's a sinner that he's suffering. And and yes, I think he's right to do so. And it, mm-hmm. it, it always mystifies me when some people try to find hints, even in the first two chapters mm-hmm. of Job doing something wrong, like reading his sacrifices for the kids as a kind of un unhealthy kind of uh, fear <laughs> uh, or, or, you know, when it says, and Job did not sin and what he said, well, he, and, you know, but in his heart, he did. <laughs> and, and I think that kind of undermines the whole idea of the book, which is, well, not the whole idea, but an important idea of the book, which is to debunk this kind of retribution theology. Right. Yeah. And we, risk acting like Job's friends when we try and find something wrong that Job must have done, right? We right, take on right, the role of Job's right, friends right. to try and look for some kind of sin. Uh, yeah, we were just laughing because um, <laughs> in our episode on Job 1 and 2, I did suggest that there may be something slightly wrong well, not wrong. Something slightly off in Job's kind of overkill sacrifices. But I did make clear to point out that I don't think it's sinful. It yeah, just yeah, suggests yeah. he's not quite uh, relating to God in the way that um, we should expect. Um, he's he's yeah. overly pious because of a certain un- misunderstanding of the fear of the Lord, possibly. But we possibly. just explored that. that, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a possibility. Or, or uh, the, the narrator is simply saying, this guy does more than necessary. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. So let's, let's look at the, the third thing that Job does a lot of in his complaints, which is to describe his suffering. And so here's an example from chapter seven, verses four to six. He says, when I lie down, I say, when shall I rise? But the night is long and I'm full of tossing until the dawn. And I think, you know, those of us who have faced suffering and anxiety of various forms, we can relate with yeah. this. And um, then he goes on to say, verse five, my flesh is clothed with worms and dirt. My skin hardens, then breaks out again. Now that's, I can say, fortunately, is not an experience that I can relate with, but um, it's a, a, an example of the extremity of Job's suffering. And then he says, verse six, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to their end without hope. So what kind of suffering, when we look at the complaints as a whole, what types of suffering does Job complain of? And is there a certain type of suffering that seems to outweigh the others in his complaints? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And, and certainly there are a, a variety of areas in which he's suffering. He's suffering physically. He's suffering um, with loss. Uh, Though he doesn't mention his kids a lot in the in the, yeah. in the dialogues, he he's suffering because of the um, lack of help and comfort from his friends, um, and but most of all, you might say he. he I, I think he's disturbed about God not being there and God, uh, his sense that God has betrayed him. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so they're all interrelated, of course, but, um, there's not, there's probably not, not, not an area in which we suffer that Job isn't suffering here. Right. Yeah. And, and those are all interrelated, but I think you're right that the kind of social like distance from others and then mm-hmm even more significantly spiritual aspect of his suffering, the distance he feels from God yeah. does, does seem as the complaints progress to mm-hmm. overwhelm the others. And so yeah. let's get to that. That's the fourth aspect of Job's complaints, which is accusing God. And we see in chapters seven, 17 to 19, some of Job's more famous complaints. Um, he says, what are human beings that you make so much of them? that you set your mind on them, visit them every morning, test them every moment. Will you not look away from me for a while? Let me alone until I swallow my spittle. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. So he's seeing Joe, God is in this kind of overbearing way. And do you see that the attack that Job makes against God progressing over the course of the complaints? Yeah, I, I do. This is the the one area that I do think there is some development within 
these uh, this controversy, and and it's kind of a internal thing with Job, right from the start. Um, in chapter nine, he he uh, he he wishes that there was someone in heaven to help him. Uh, and I'll read nine fourteen to twenty, where he says, "How then can I dispute with him?" Remember, he thinks that the solution to his problem is to confront God. How can I find words to argue with him? Though I were innocent, I could not answer him. I could only plead with my judge for mercy. Even if I summoned him and he responded, I do not believe he would give me a hearing. He would crush me with a storm and multiply my wounds for no reason. He would not let me catch my breath, but would overwhelm me with misery. If it's a matter of strength, he's mighty. And if it's a matter of justice, who can challenge him? Even if I were innocent, my mouth would condemn me. If I were shame, blameless, it would pronounce me guilty. But, but starting in chapter 16, he starts um, thinking about the possibility of uh, the Hebrews variously translated as a mediator arbiter, uh, referee even. But at the end of chapter 16 and verses 18, um, let's see, Job, he says uh, in verses 18 to 21, he goes, earth do not cover my blood. May my cry never be laid to rest. Even now my witness is in heaven. My advocate is on high. My intercessor is my friend. As my eyes pour out tear to God on behalf of a man, he pleads with God as one pleads for a friend. And then he grows in confidence. So, you know, right toward the end of, of his, um, he has a monologue from 28 to 31. After the three friends kind of run out of steam and before Elihu enters, we have a few chapters where Job seems to be speaking to the air, so to speak. And um, at the end of 31, he says this, um, 35 to 37, oh, that I had someone to hear me. I sign now my defense that the almighty answer me. Let my accuser put his indictment in writing. Surely I would wear it on my shoulder. I would put it on like a crown. I would give him an account of my every step. I would present it to him. Uh, as to a ruler. So it's kind of like, let me at him, you know, I'm ready. Um, and of course, I think one of the ironies of the book of Job is uh, to ask the question, well, in terms of chapter 16, what kind of help is Job expecting? And I think Elihu says something in chapter 33 that uh, kind of um, helps us understand it when Elihu says, He's talking about a theoretical situation when somebody, this is 33, 19 and following, somebody may be chastened on a bed of pain with constant distress in their bones so that their body finds food repulsive and their soul loathes the choicest meal. Their flesh wastes away to nothing and their bones once hidden now stick out. They draw near to the pit and their life to the messengers of death. And that kind of describes Job. And then he goes, yet if there's an angel at their side, a messenger, one out of a thousand, sent to tell them how to be upright. And he's gracious to that person and says to God, spare them from going down to the pit. I found a ransom for them, et cetera. So Elihu imagines this heavenly scene where an angel comes and, you know, kind of mediates for the supper and intercedes for them. Now, the, the irony of the situation is we know from chapters one and two that there is an angel in heaven that's talking to God about Job. He's known as the accuser, and <laughs> he's not there interceding for Job, right? So, um, so it all kind of, you know, Job builds up his confidence. He goes, let, let me add him to accuse him of injustice. And at that point, if you know the end of the book of Job, you might, you might be saying to yourself, Job, you ought to be, you, you ought to be careful what you hope for, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, that language from chapter nine about him, this verse 17, for he crushes me with a tempest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For, right. That seems to be a foreshadowing yeah. of um, the Lord appearing in the whirlwind at the end of the book. So there right. seems to be some kind of a progression, at least in Job, he's reaching for different answers uh, and seeking them out. Yeah. 
Um, but along the way, I mean, he says some things that you know are concerning. Uh, they definitely concern the friends, and I think they might concern a lot of us. We may not have paid much attention to them. Um, right there in chapter 9, we've got verses 22 to 23, uh, where it says, it is all where Job says, it is all one. Therefore, I say he, talking about God, destroys both the blameless and the wicked. When disaster brings sudden death, he mocks, talking about God, he mocks at the calamity of the innocent. And then in the next chapter, verse three, Job says, does it seem good to you, God, to oppress, to despise the work of your hands and favor the schemes of of the wicked. Um, is Job just plain wrong to say these kinds of things to God? Like, could this be an example of Job sinning with his lips, as we mentioned earlier? Mm. Well, um, I, he, here's why I don't think so, uh, even though I think he's wrong in what he says. Uh, and that is, and again, I'd appeal to the lament psalms and contrast them with the grumbling in the wilderness. All right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so even though he does complain about God to the three friends, but he also maintains this relationship with God where he's expressing what he feels. And I think, again, as we said earlier, God invites that kind of boldness. God invites that kind of, you know, as John Calvin said uh, about the Psalms, he goes, there's not an emotion felt by man that isn't expressed in this book like a mirror. Mm. So, so the difference between Job taking his complaints to God and, and as opposed to what happens in the wilderness, they never take their complaints to God. Uh, they just talk amongst themselves. Oh, that horrible God that brought us out of the land of Egypt. And that brings God's judgment. Whereas I, I think Job complaining to God is actually showing a continuing relationship with God. He hasn't given up on God. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. So the distinction is complaining about God versus complaining to God. It sounds like. Yeah. I, I think that's what I see um, because complaining to God, you know, shows that you still have hope. Even mm -hmm. say Psalm 88, that very dark Psalm that ends darkness is my closest friend. Uh, he's still talking to God. And even mm -hmm. in the opening, he says, you are the God of my salvation. Well, apparently not yet, but <laughs> right. he still has hope in God. Yeah. I mean, I, and I think uh, another distinction that you can see between what Job does and what the Israelites do and they're complaining in the wilderness is, their complaint comes from a lack of faith in God to provide, right? They say, yeah, right. God, oh, did yeah, you just right. bring us out here to die? Right. right. Like, in being that that's, that's what God has in mind. But I would suggest that what we see in Job here is he's arguing with God out of an expectation that yeah. God is a just and mm. good God. And if God yeah. can just yeah. be convinced that Job's situation is not just, yeah. then God will change the situation, right? So even like chapter 10, verse three, when he says, does it seem good to you to oppress, to despise the work of your hands? The assumption is, of course it doesn't, right? That's not the God that Job knows. It's a lot right. like uh, Genesis 18, where Abraham says, yeah. shall not the judge of all the earth mm -hmm. do what is just? But the assumption is, he's the judge of all the earth. Of course he will do what, what is just. Yeah. If he yeah. can be convinced that this is the just. Now, if that's the case, then it seems like Job is buying into retribution theology still. Mm -hmm. But then these other statements that Will just read, like 922, it is all one. Therefore, I say he destroys both the blameless and the wicked. Mm. That seems to suggest, you know, a statement like that, that he's actually rejecting the retribution principle. Mm. Mm. Trevor, what do you think? Is he rejecting uh, it or is he <laughs> holding on to it? Well, that's good. I mean, sometimes in suffering, we have these kind of tensions, right? On the one hand, I think what he's saying is God is supposed to be acting according to the retribution theology. But what I'm seeing here, particularly with my own suffering, is that he destroys the innocent and the guilty. Um, I, uh, yeah, that, at least that's my initial response to that question. But but I, I, I do know myself, you know, when I'm struggling with something, I, I'm full of tensions and will sometimes say different things. But um, but yeah, 
But I've so yeah, yeah, he doesn't reject retribution theology until the end. I think. Okay. Okay. And how does that the rejection at the end come about? Well, the rejection at the end comes about in response to the Yahweh speeches. You know, where Yahweh will um, Yahweh essentially is. Um, is putting Job in his place. And there are a lot of contemporary uh, scholarly writers on Job who hate the conclusion, you know, this idea of uh, uh, God coming and putting Job in his place. But, but actually, uh, he does um, by asking a whole series of questions that Job can't answer. And he's asserting in these chapters both his wisdom and his power. And, uh, and Job recognizes this and he has a, uh, you know, a more intimate experience with God than he had before in his second, uh, speech, his second response to the Yahweh speeches. He says, I, I had heard of you, but now I see you, you know? So, so, and that, that deeper experience with God, uh, allows him now to step back from his accusations of injustice and to suffer in silence. You know, Um, Mm -hmm. it's kind of like a move. Well, so Walter Brueggemann famously and helpfully talked about how the Psalms have a kind of uh, trio in tandem with each other, where hymns are Psalms of orientation, laments are Psalms of disorientation that you sing when things go bad, similar to Job's laments to God. And then when God answers your lament, um, then you sing a Thanksgiving psalm, a psalm of reorientation. Uh, Glenn Pemberton uh, wrote a really good book where he said, well, what happens? And and Glenn suffers from physical and other Mm -hmm. issues. He talks about it in his book on the Psalms of confidence. He he uh, says, "Well, what happens if God doesn't answer your lament? What if you have pain all of your life? Do you just keep lamenting the whole your whole life?" And he said, uh, "Well, that's what the Psalms of confidence are all, all about about expressing trust in God in the midst of your suffering. You know, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me." Or you know. Psalm 131, I've stilled and quieted my soul. Um, and, and so I see Job teaching us how to suffer uh, along with, say, Lamentations 3. There's a similar kind of dynamic there. And also, uh, and then I think biblical theologically, think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Father, take this cup from me. And he's described as as sweating like drops of blood. And then it says, uh, Father, your will, not mine, be done. You know, right. so. Yeah. Well, and, and that leads us into the next question I wanted to ask, because uh, in your co- commentary, you quote David Kleins, uh, a leading Job scholar. And, and Klein says this. <laughs> Viewed as an answer to the problem of suffering, then the argument of the book of Job is, by all means, let Job the patient be your model, so long as that is possible for you. But when equanimity fails, let the grief and anger of Job the impatient direct itself and yourself toward God, for only an encounter with him will the tension of suffering be resolved. So do you agree with Kleins there that the goal is to be the Job of the prologue? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. if you can't pull that off, <laughs> then go ahead and be the Job <laughs> of the complaints in the dialogue. Yeah, yeah. And and referring to my previous uh statement, I, I just don't think it goes far enough, you know, because uh-huh. you notice how David kind of keeps it in the Job the impatient. And because I think I think then you know, eventually God wants us to get to the Job, the trusting. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but, I, but I would also say, I'm not saying that people who lament all their life are, you know, God is angry at them or anything. Uh, uh, it's just the hope is to move to a place of trust in the midst of suffering. Right. And maybe even that process of lamenting can be like part of what moves you forward. uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
through that. Yeah, matter of fact, you know, I, I, it may be wrong, but I, I think there are precious few people who can stay with Job the patient in the light of deep suffering. Okay. Mm-hmm. Kind of like this is not exactly the same, but I remember my psychologist friend and often co author Dan Allender talking about somebody who comes in for marriage counseling and says, We've been married 30 years, we've never had a fight, you know, and he goes, Well, that means either you're lying to me or you're brain dead. <laughs> so, and it's kind of like, uh, um, you know, we all experience, there's just no escaping deep loss and suffering in this life. And we need to know at least that God you know, wants us to turn to him in our suffering. Right. Yeah. And in fact, just to pick up on that analogy, um, I've thought about what happens as Job as a kind of fight within a marriage, which I don't know what Dan Allender would say, and I'm not a psychologist, but, uh, you know, as long as the couple is fighting, there's still yeah. hope for the marriage. Yeah. But yeah once they great. stop, then, mm-hmm. you know, that's, yeah. that's a different thing. I could tell Dan and I often teach on Job, well, once a year, teach on Job and trauma uh, mm-hmm. at the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. And I can assure you, based on that experience, that he would totally affirm that. And I will communicate it to him and will footnote you. <laughs> there we go. All right. Thank you. Uh, Trump, Trumper, after um, in Job chapter 42, so after, you know, the Lord has addressed Job, uh, We read here in chapter 42, verse 7, After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. So I'm wondering, does God approve of Job's complaints? Um, Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And um, and I would say. Not in the sense of saying, hey, Job, everything you said is right. I am unjust, you know, but I, but I think <laughs> it's getting again to this idea of not breaking relationship, uh, staying with me and eventually, you know, um, turning away from the accusation of injustice, uh, which um, let's see in Job chapter 40. Right after Job's first response, you, you you hear God saying, "Would you discredit my my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself?" You know. So, my point being here is, it's it's too much to say God's just giving kind of blanket approval to everything Job says, um, because after all, why would he appear in a whirlwind? You know, right. why would he put Job through his paces? But it is this idea of, you know, be stuck with me through this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think, I think 48 is a crucial verse because to come back to our marriage analogy, I think part of what God is saying to Job here, because he's using this legal language, mm-hmm. will you put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Is, you know, Job, it looks like you are toying with initiating divorce proceedings between us. Yeah, yeah. And let's yeah. not go that yeah. route, yeah. right? Yeah. Let's continue yeah. to, to <laughs> fight this out <laughs> if we have to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but once yeah. we're divorced, that's a different thing. Yeah. Uh, altogether. Right. What was it in verse eight that made you uh, say that? But 48 will put me in the wrong. And then will you condemn me that you may justify, may be justified. Mm. That's all legal type of language. And it's suggesting that Job is setting up a kind of win lose situation. Right. Mm. So either God is right or Job is right. Right. But I think there's a sense in the way that I read it, at least is that what we're seeing in Job's complaints is a way in which Job can fight with God uh, and both of them can win in a sense, as long as Job is able to expand his understanding of what relationship okay. with God looks like, which mm-hmm. is what I was kind of hearing you say, Tremper, in terms of what Job learns in right. God's appearance to him. And that right. was, that leads to, I had heard of you, but now I have seen yeah, you. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that's right.
Well, Trimber, thanks so much for taking the time to walk us through this difficult part of this difficult book. As we've discussed, we, we just have one more question for you. Uh, one of the things that we like to do at the end of our episodes is give our guests an opportunity to partake in this popular genre amongst biblical scholars, which is the blurb. Uh, so you have blurbed in your career, a number of books. Uh, so I know that you are uh, well-practiced in this genre. So is there anything that you would blurb for us? It could be a book, but it could be anything else, uh, a TV show or um, a movie or a life hack. So wow. anything that you've discovered lately in your life that you think others might profit from? Yeah, well, quickly, maybe two. Uh, one, very serious, uh, you know, Jeremy Tisby and Esau Macaulay's books, uh, Color Compromise and, uh, and Reading While Black, I think are really important for this moment, getting the attention it deserves. And, uh, and on a more fun note, uh, WandaVision. I don't, know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether you like the Marvel Universe, but I watched the first three episodes, okay? And, uh, and I'm bored out of my mind. And I tell my son... <laughs> This is ridiculous. What's this about? And then he goes, watch the next episode. Yeah. <laughs> it gets very interesting. Yeah, I also really enjoyed WandaVision, but I, I really like the first three because I love parody. And so there's a oh, yeah. you know, parody of these different genres. But oh, I yeah. do want to warn our listeners that WandaVision, it, it's kind of a gateway drug to that whole Marvel oh, yeah. universe. Oh, yeah. That's the yeah. effect that it's had on our family because right. I watched it with our kids and then our kids were like, well, we want to know who Wanda is and who Vision yeah, is. Right, so then we, right. And there's like 25 movies that oh, you yeah. have to watch. Oh, yeah. Well, they're going to be, they're going to be many, many more. <laughs> <laughs> as long as they can make millions of dollars on each of them. Oh, yeah. Tremper's yeah. pointing yeah. you in the right direction. All right. Thanks, Tremper. Well, Tremper, thanks for taking the time to take us on this guided journey through the, uh, through Job's complaints. And to you, our listeners, if you have been complaining that there is no really great guide through scripture. There are many guides through scripture, but one that doesn't quite fit your fancy. Yeah. Uh, hopefully we have solved your complaint and God has sent this podcast to be the, uh, the salve of your complaint. Yeah. And uh, if it is now, if you're still complaining, you didn't like this podcast, you can keep that complaint to yourself and keep complaining about it, but you don't need to share it with anyone. Uh, but if you've enjoyed this podcast, please go to the two testaments.com and subscribe uh, to the website, to the podcast, and also go share it on Facebook, share it with your friends, with your family, uh, share it with anyone who needs some comfort. The Two Testaments is produced with the support of Sanford University, where Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes are professors in the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies. Thanks to Joe Zellner, Jody McFarlane, and the team in the Faculty Success Center, and our student assistants, Carson Knopf, Jake Maddox, Harrison Pike, and Gracie Plonk, for their help with production, editing, and promotion.